Are we on? Are we on? Welcome, welcome, welcome to Basketball Heads Live. I am your host, Glenn Poole Harding. And oh boy, we have a very special guest. This basketball head is a Long Island and Babylon High School legend. He was a certified recruit, accepting a scholarship to play at North Carolina under legendary coach Dean Smith. But UNC wasn't a fit for this basketball head because he was looking to return home to attend St. John's University and play for another legendary head coach in Lou Conaseca. At St. John's, he found a home where he was able to play with the likes of New York City greats like Boo Harvey, Jason Williams, Billy Singleton, and alongside another Long Island legend in Shelton Jones. At St. John's, this basketball head was not only known for his physical play and high IQ, but he was a defensive specialist who could also rack up buckets if you slept on his game. After his college career was over, he went undrafted, was, but was picked up and signed by the Chicago Bulls. Professional career in play that included the then in itself Michael Allen's story. So without further ado, help me show Long Allen and Blonde Legend and St. John's University standout. My guy, Matt Bruh. Hey, hey, what's happening, my brother? How you doing? I'm doing well. That's quite a buildup. I, I hope I can uh, I can come through for you. Nah, brother, nah, brother. Well deserved, man. Just want to say uh, thank you for us on Basketball Heads Live podcast. And, and I like this, man. Um, you was one of the New York guys you know, I, I was looking at and, and kind of was inspired to go ahead and reached the division one level it was a few of you guys and you was in that bunch man so thank you for representing the right way and, and doing it you know the way you wanted to do it you know what i'm saying so welcome thank you so much thank you so much being well, in a great great experience what was it like growing up in babylon give me a little bit of background about what babylon is like for all the people who don't know or never traveled out to Long Island, been long. Tell me what life was like for you. You ever been hanging out in the woods? <laughs> Not a lot going on there. Uh, small town, uh, a great tradition though for basketball, small school. Um, we had some, uh, for a short period of time there in the late seventies uh, into the early eighties, we had, we had a few great teams. Um, probably remember the great Glenn Vickers and, who ended up going to Iona, played for, was one of Jim Valvano's first recruits. Um, and, and those Babylon teams, my brother Chris was on that team. Uh, at the time, they had the Long Island Championship, and it didn't matter what size the school was. So uh, Babylon won back-to-back -back championships in 75, 76, and 76, 77. And uh, it's never been repeated. And ever since the change with school sizes, uh, 
yeah, we'll probably never see that again. But we came from a pretty good tradition. Small school, though. Listen, the Long Island Championships remind me what they do out in Staten Island with the Staten Island Championship because it's such a huge thing for the community. And I think if they kind of bring that back, I think it'll build up Long Island to where it should be. You know what I'm saying? So it would just be like one or two dominant teams. Well, at the time, all, all, the, the great teams from, from New York and, and the city and the surrounding boroughs and, and, and Long Island, that, that's, where all, that's where all the talent was. I mean, um, you know, uh, upstate New York had, had some players uh, for sure, but uh, it was some great times. We, we, uh, and our, our championship was held at, at the old Nassau Coliseum before they, they wrecked that place. But uh, there were some great, great tournaments there. Jeff Rulin played for Sachem High School and Babylon beat them. Uh, you know, so there, there were a lot. Kevin Hamilton from North Babylon. Uh, you, know, you, you, you there's so many names uh, at that time. It just it was a great time for basketball in Long Island. Great time for basketball in New York City as a whole, because when when Long Island and upstate New York are doing well, that makes the whole state. Absolutely, uh, the, the city teams uh, at my time, uh, you know they. They had Mark Jackson, Kenny Smith, Walter Berry, and of course, uh, you know, Lord rest his soul, the Pearl, who was just magic with the basketball. Uh, you know, we, we used to play the the old Newsday Classic, where it was the city against Long Island, and uh, you know, we came out on the court, and and it was kind of myself, Derek Brower, and Shelton Jones, and we're, we're you know, we're just are we supposed to be here or not? Uh, but uh, we actually ended up beating them uh, one year, and it was just, it, just the, the the rivalry and the intensity was just terrific. It was great basketball. All right, so we're gonna jump right into the show. I wanted to get some of that out the way, um, but my first question we we'll always ask everyone: the official question is, who introduced you to the game? Well, my brothers, uh, both my brothers were athletes. Um, my oldest brother was a baseball player, um, and he ended up. Uh, pitching at the University of Miami and then for the the then California Angels um, wow. and got hurt. Uh, and after that, there was there was my sister who I tell the I tell uh, the joke, it was not really a joke, it's true. She probably won more games than all of us combined. She was wow. six and, and girl sports weren't that big in the 70s. She was a four sport player and uh, yeah, I don't think she ever lost a game. So she was another one. And then, and then of course, my brother, Chris, um, you know, ended up uh, being recruited and playing at North Carolina, winning the uh, national championship in 1982. Um, so, you know, it was, we were a sports family and, you know, just kind of followed along with everybody else. So listen, Matt, when I got introduced to the game of basketball, the first pro basketball game I saw was when Magic Johnson was on the Lakers during his rookie season. The first college basketball game I ever watched from front to back was that North Carolina championship against Georgetown. All of my friends, and this is how it happened, all of my friends was going for Georgetown. Right. And for the one time I don't follow my friends, I was the only guy room for North Carolina. Yeah, it, that game, you know, whenever you think of that game, the first thing that comes to your mind is poor Fred Brown, you know, uh, you know, the, thank God they came back and won it next year. And, you know, Coach Thompson was real great with Fred and, you know, just hugged him at midcourt. But, uh, yeah, that was that was a great that was just a, a great, great game. And, um, yeah, I mean, you know, Patrick Ewing was unbelievable. I mean, he was just. Like, a, he came from another world. I mean, he just, you know, just played his played his, his lights out. That that was such a remarkable game. I, I, I'll never forget it. Um, you know, since your brother had a real big impact on you, um, what was the family house like watching that championship game? Like, you know, I know you guys watched the Final Four, and then once they got to the championship, what was the Brush family house like during that time? Well, uh, everybody bit their nails off. Uh, nobody wanted anything to eat or drink. We had special spots on the floor of the living room on the carpet where we didn't move. 
uh, which made it kind of a problem if you had to use the bathroom. But, uh, you know, it was uh, there was a lot of voodoo going on in the house and, and a lot of cross fingers. <laughs> Man, oh man, I want to shout out my guy Larry Wooders, who's in the building, probably one of your guys. Thank you for, for joining us. He said a lot of, he said a lot of Iona names mentioned there. Must be a big Iona fan right there. But yeah, that, that, that time, you know, I didn't know too many guys that was on the court. I didn't know anyone's name. I didn't know James Worthy. I heard about Patrick Ewan. I didn't, I didn't know I was just first getting introduced to the game back then. And, and it did a lot for the basketball player, knowing that the team that I was rooting for won. And I had bragging rights over all of my friends because everyone was going for Georgetown. And I became a North Carolina fan after that. So that's how that worked. North Carolina has a, <clears throat> had a great history of, of getting a lot of players. And, uh, they, you know, that was Dean Smith. Finally climbed the mountaintop, and that was his first championship. <clears throat> wow, wow. So you, you, you think about all the great players that came out of Long Island, right? You, you mentioned a few. Um, and, their, and their impact on the game. Who was the best player in the neighborhood? Was it, your brother? Was it your brother everyone wanted to be like? Who was the guy in the or surrounding that everyone wanted to be like you know in my time the guy who used to really impress me a lot was uh bernard king and uh that was probably one of the first games uh that i ever saw at uh madison square garden and um that guy could just score uh, it didn't matter what you did to him i mean after a while you just scratch your head and say someone's got to hit him with a chair because, you know, this guy is just running over everybody. I mean, that guy could just pour in points uh, so hard, so fast. And, uh, you know, a lot of guys kind of just styled their game after him. I mean, he just he was just incredible to watch. So you guys was on the island looking towards the city because I heard you mention a few times. And, you know, you all know how we felt about Pearl in the city. There, was a lot of the guys from the city impact was felt on Long Island as well? You know, I I, I, I wouldn't know what, what they were thinking, but, you know, after they played us, they knew they had a game. Um, you know, I, I, they, I remember going in through the warmups and Kenny Smith is jumping from the foul line and dunking the ball and, and Pearl is dribbling all over the place. And, you know, some of us could hardly even reach the rim. And, uh, you know, uh, but uh, I don't think they were too afraid of us. But uh, once we got into the game and the good thing, the thing about uh, what we put forth was a lot of effort and uh, our intensity was once, once the ball went up, all the noise, the crowd, who we were playing against went out the window. And we just, you know, we just had this killer instinct. And, and it was, I, I think those guys respected that. I know when I came to St. John's, uh, you know, guys like Mark Jackson, really became good friends with me. I mean, Chris Mullen, I used to work out with uh, during my redshirt year and, uh, you know, so many other guys, uh, even guys at Carolina, you know, uh, when I played there briefly, Dave Pops and Joe Wolf, Dave Pops was a very good friend of mine. And uh, they just said, man, you know, you, you New Yorkers are intense. I said, well, you know, some of us are. <laughs> right, right. Everybody, some, some guys, you know, real cool and all that, but you, you played so hard. Um, and like I was telling you before, you was one of the guys that kind of inspired me because you wasn't afraid of anyone. You were God the best. You didn't care who they were. And, and I kind of admired that as a young guy looking at you um, on TV when I used to watch St. John's play, man. So kudos to you. Well, I, I thank you. I, I, I kind of had a bit of a cheat sheet because um, my, my brother was at, at Carolina. His last year was Michael Jordan's first year. Mm. So I remember when Michael came in and, you know, Michael wasn't Michael yet, but he, he was some special player. And uh, I knew him when he was 18. And uh, at that of Carolina, historically, every summer, all the players go back, the NBA guys, and they work out. And I got the opportunity my freshman year to, to play against him and, Pretty much once you go against Michael Jordan, there isn't really much to be afraid of after that. 
Right, right, definitely. Do do you have your Wi-Fi on 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 your phone? Uh, I believe so. Yes. Let it let it work for the Wi-Fi from your phone instead of the Wi-Fi in your house, because I think that's why we're pausing a little bit. Okay. Um, let me check this out. All right. Take 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 your time. I'm right here. Uh, are, are you meant? Are you understanding all the names he's talking about? Like it's it's such an amazing thing when you talk about the history of New York City basketball, Long Island, upstate, and especially Long Island during that time. Um, it was just a special place to play. Um, you had some very very good players from out. There. You had uh, Matt Darty. You had Dr. J, who's from out there. The Bruss family that's out there. The Brow family that's out there. It, it, it was just amazing all over. Uh, we don't wait till uh, Matt come back. Hopefully, I didn't take him fully offline. He'll be right back. I changed it, so hopefully it, it'll be okay. There you go. There you go. Cool, cool. We back. Yeah, so where, where was the place that you guys met up in Long Island to play pickup ball? Was it a few places? Was it a main spot, a main hub where all the best players would play at? Well, locally for us, uh... And it started with the Vickers brothers. Um, the, it, it, Glenn was friends with Kevin Hamilton. And, and uh, you know, that's how we made peace with those guys. You know, it was like uh, they were the enemy. But in the summertime, we'd go down to Phelps Lane, uh, which was a, 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 you know, a bunch of cement blacktop courts. And, uh, you know, we they played for hours down there. And, and the competition was Stan Wilcox and, uh, all those guys, uh, Carlton Hurdle. I mean, uh, you know, it was some great, great matchups. Uh, as we as we got older, um, you know, we we just end up playing in the Smithtown. There was a uh, Smithtown summer league out there, which each school got represented. And um, and then of course the, the 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 Empire State games came, and and that's where we all really became friends. You know, when when we played against each other, we were enemies, but most of the time we were. We were friends uh, off the court and, and definitely in the Empire State games. For those of you that don't know about the Empire State games, listen, it was New York State's Olympics. All sports, we would meet up state and we would play. Um, but one of the big things, of course, when we talked about it, was the basketball. And I want to let you talk about that amazing game because it was talked about before on here. I, I can't remember the guys who I had on, but that game was talked about. My guy, Rick Combs, who went to Uniondale High School, he always talked about that game. Um, who else I had? I asked uh, my guy, oh, man, he played for North Carolina. His name is coming. I mean, he played for Maryland. He played with Len Bias. He's from out in Long Island as well. Uh, but he talked about the game. But let's just, just from your perspective, because you was there and you were playing, um, give me some of the names of the guys who was on both teams and then give me the breakdown of the game. Well, when, when we played uh, our last year, uh, we, we, were, um, we weren't really picked to do much of anything at the time. Uh, New York City was just loaded. I, I mean, they had, they had Walter Berry, Mark Jack Mark Jackson was like a seventh man. That just tells you how good they were. Uh, you know, Kenny Smith, um, Wendell Alexis. Um, uh, and I remember Derek Chivas. I know you had him on you, yeah. your show, The Parade Man. And uh, uh, you know, Boo Harvey was part of that group. And, uh, you know, there was just, you know, and I'm probably – crossing over where some guys were some years and others, but mo mostly th those were the guys that, that they had. We had, it, it was myself, Derek Brower, and that was kind of it. We had a couple guys from North Babylon. Um, yeah, Shelton didn't even play uh, that wow. year. Wow. Um, and uh, we ended up going up there and uh, we had the final against New York City uh, and I don't know how we did it, but uh, Derek Brower ended up having like 41 points. It went, and, and De poor Derek, and, and he'll laugh at this because he, you know, we're family, so I can say it. He probably had a vertical leap of about a half an inch, and <laughs> mine was about a quarter of an inch. So you know, we weren't relying on our skill. 
but uh, it, it was a battle. And, and, and Pearl uh, was unbelievable. I mean, that guy, it was like a magic show, you know, what he did with the basketball. Uh, you know, I, I think that, I mean, the, you could stand four and five feet off him and guys would dare him to shoot and he would still drive around you, make layups. And, uh, and, oh my God, it just an incredible, incredible player. We had to put two and three guys on him just so he'd give up the ball. But, uh, I mean, we, we, we scored in the high, you know, the one twenties and, you know, long island basketball is like, if you score in the the sixties or seventies, you're going to win. But we, (laughs) we had a heck of a night and, uh, you know, it was just a, such a great atmosphere. You're right about it. it was. It was an Olympics type atmosphere, and uh, a young Kenny Anderson was up there, you know, just watching. And uh, you know, I I always kind of get a kick out of Jim Beheim. You know, that guy had the pick of the litter. I was at the Syracuse University. He recruited every one of those guys. You know, and no other college coach is going to come around. So you know, Jim had a great run with a lot of players from from uh, from the Empire State games. Yeah, he did. He definitely did. I want to congratulate uh, Adrian Orchi for taking over uh, the Bayheim. I know he's going to do a great job up there. You yeah, know, that keep it, keep it in New York City. That's that's that's. A- Adrian's a great guy. I played played with him and against him, and uh, knows the game of basketball. And uh, there've been a few coaching changes, and I think that that'll be a good one for him. It's never easy following. Uh, Coach Beheim has been there for 47 years. You know, like he said, he never left. Um, but Adrian's a solid guy. And and if he can get players, you know, uh, he'll do well. Speaking of coaching changes, uh, St. John's is coaching change. What do you what do you think about Rick Pitino joining out there uh, at St. John's? Well, Rick, Rick is clearly a Hall of Fame coach. Um, he he he's been, he's bounced around a bit. Um, but Rick, uh, is an incredible basketball mind. Uh, I think he is the, definitely the best choice available. And even if he wasn't, uh, I still think it was a very good choice for St. John's. I mean, uh, it's been painful watching St. John's the past, you know, 25, 30 years and see them struggle like they have. And, uh, um, it, it's just, it's, uh, you know, I, I think finally they're, 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 they've got things going there and, and Rick will make those guys work. You know, he's already come out and said a few things about if you're not going to work hard, you're not going to play for me. And, and that's a throwback. And uh, the, the thing about the young guys today, they'll listen to someone like him because of his track record. If you want to go to the NBA, you better do what Rick Pitino says. That's right. That's right. Salute to my guy Van Makins. He will be standing on the staff at St. John's. So I saw him uh, this weekend up at the uh, state championship games. And, you know, uh, I know Van is going to do well. And salute to my guy, Craig Carter, as well. New York City great. I was with him the whole weekend, man. So, you know, a lot of good New York City basketball uh, connections up in the States. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So I want to go back a little bit, right, to where you got in high school at Babylon. Like, how was your transitions? Because, you know, you think about your brother was a star, recruited to go to North Carolina, and then you come in. Um, what was expected of you? And did you play varsity right ahead, right away, or did you start on JV? Tell me the process. Well, it, it was a little bit, um, you know, maybe I was just kind of dumb, uh, I guess is a good word for it. Um, I never really thought of it as pressure. Again, I mentioned at the top of the show, my, my oldest brother, Jerry, um, uh, ended up pitching in the College World Series. And, and uh, his, his best friend is Joe Madden. And, um, you know, he was the guy that I was really intimidated by. Um, he, he just worked, worked, worked and uh, just got the job done. As far as when I, when I came through, I, I was uh, I. I made the varsity as a freshman uh i was a guard and then my from my sophomore year to my senior year i was a six foot five center so wow yeah so i i had uh, quite a transition going from center back to guard and i had to learn how to handle the ball all over all over again and and as far as shooting is concerned sometimes i just couldn't throw it in the ocean <laughs> <laughs> 
Wow, wow. So when you was making the transition, what was it uh the pickup game that got your golf skills up, or was it the basketball camp that you attended? You know, it was really the pickup games. Um, I didn't go to too many camps. Um, the, the only camp that I ever went to, uh, Mitch Kupchak, uh, the GM of the Hornets and longtime GM of the Lakers, he went to Brentwood High School. And uh, he had a, a basketball camp out there. And um, when my brother was being recruited, he got asked to come and be a camp counselor. So uh, as a kid, I got to go there for free. Um, the camps were, 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 were good. But uh, it, it, there was a lot of pickup going on um, in, in Babylon. The summer leagues out there, uh, you know, attracted a lot of coaches. And, you know, for a lot of young players today, uh, it's unfortunate because you see a lot of these kids playing in a, in a ton of AAU and they're traveling all over the place. And, and they're really full of anxiety about, oh, I'm never going to be seen. Well, I can tell you, as, as Luke Karnaseka said, if you're good, we'll find you. And uh, that's exactly what happened. We didn't have the internet. We didn't have social media. And I was on a postage stamp of a town uh, in Long Island and, and, and people found me. Um, I, you know, I was a three sport athlete. You know, I could have gone anywhere I, I wanted. Uh, but it's these coaches are so plugged in. They will find you. And uh, unfortunately, I think with social media and uh, all these AAU things, uh, it's not healthy for the kids. Uh, you know, th they lose the love of the game pretty fast. Um, physically, it's it's way too demanding. Um, you need to have fun. You need to love the game first before you can, you know, look at it as something that you really want to pursue. And I loved basketball. And, and, and the people around me and the, the high school coaches that were around me, uh, were very caring and supportive. And even, you know, when I got to North Carolina, it was the same thing. And although I, it didn't work out for me there, um, I just was a homesick New Yorker. Uh, I called up Coach Garnasek, and the first thing he did, uh, they were ranked number one at the time. And he said, when's the next plane to back to New York? And that's all I needed to hear. And uh, a lot of those guys really knew how to be uh, psychiatrists as well as very good basketball coaches. I think the myth with AAU basketball <clears throat> is that you're only going to get seen if you play AAU basketball. Um, and the fact that kids aren't playing too much pickup ball, right? There, there's not a lot of pickup ball with some of the best players. You know, I, I give it up to Gaucho. They have great runs there. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as every place else, I, the, the parks are not packed with some of the best players um, to kind of get their games where it needs to be. And I think another thing that's missing, then these high school kids are not playing against the college kids who come home. So there's like a separation, right? We was fortunate to play against a lot of the guys who came home or some of the more well-known guys who played and would come back and give us their time and we could at least – measure our games and see what we need to work on. Uh, AAU is good, but I don't think it gives you that, you know? Well, AAU essentially, well, let's call it what it is. It's a business. Um, I, I don't, uh, the kids are basically told that, you know, unless you're uh, in my AAU program or this AAU, pro that AAU program, you're not going to be seen. And, and that's, that's a tragedy. And to what you're describing, you know, Heck, the coaches, uh, you know, I remember uh, Jim Valvano's longtime assistant, Tom Abadamarco. I mean, uh, that guy was a, the, mo the most tenacious recruiter I ever saw. I mean, that guy would show up in the park. Hell, he'd show up in your backyard. You know, I mean, these, you know, these guys, would again, would come and find you. Um, but the, the AAU experience, um, unfortunately, that's kind of how things go. Um, and, you know, with the with the, the the portal now and uh, which is really hurting more of the game than it's helping it uh, i i really don't understand how how the rules have changed so much so uh that that i, I think it's really injurious to the game speaking of the transfer portal the fact that you transferred from north carolina right to st john's 
and had to sit out a year. If, but if the transfer portal was in existence back then, you wouldn't have to sit out a year. Right. You know? But I, I heard, I, heard uh, I, w- I was watching ESPN and, and I was listening to Clark Kellogg um, who played at Ohio State and he's, he's got a nice uh, gig with ESPN and, and he said something really intelligent. He said, the, the portal is dangerous for these young kids because it creates instant gratification. Now that's logical, but he went on to say that kids for their growth as individuals to grow their character to grow, to, to work on their games, you know, because they're not, they have to learn to overcome adversity. And you may go to a place that, look, I went to Carolina and, and there was adversity for me there, but I had to stay there for a while to, to really understand what the adversity was. I had to find a solution of how to change my situation and my circumstances and recreate my life. And because it wasn't instant gratification that I could just run to the next school um, I had to make darn sure that I was making the best possible decision for me. I mean, heck, I, I left and for six months I had to work uh, at a car dealership prepping cars, you know. So I had quite a full, uh, quite quite a humbling experience going from being a top player and Division One recruit. And here I was uh, kind of in between and, uh, you know, I, I lost a lot of friends for sure and people that were saying all great things about me and so i had a lot to prove and uh i had a lot of time to think about it and and when i got to st john's uh i I was prepared academically uh i knew where i wanted to go there and uh, i was prepared physically to uh to go out and 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 become the player that that ultimately I, i i was Let's go back to what you said, because I think that's very important. And this is a message for you young guys out there. The people that love you and praise you, and then when you do something that they don't like, or you make a move, or they they feel like you're, you're not on the pedestal that they put you on, how they change on you. Oh, well, that, that's, that's in anything. Uh, And, and, you know, Coach Karnaseka was filled, uh, which uh, I, I, I lovingly called Lewisms. Um, he, he was like Yogi Berra. He had a saying for everything. And uh, he used to say, uh, be careful, uh, uh, you know, how and, and, you know, where you are in your career. He, he said, because you're a peacock today, peacock today, but you could be a feather duster tomorrow. So, you know, you respected the process. You respected the coaching staff. Uh, and you put in the work. And uh, unfortunately, uh, young kids don't know that. Um, with the with social media, all you see is the end result. You know, they, they all turn on the Golden State Warriors and they see the great Steph Curry shooting shots from half court. I mean, that guy is, is, is incredible. But you know what? It didn't start out that way. You know, he was just a small, scrawny kid somewhere from wh- where he grew up and probably was the eighth or ninth kid because of his size to be picked on a pickup game. But he worked and worked and worked. And uh, again, that's that's the downside of uh, a transfer portal. Uh, and again, only seeing, you know, magnificent plays. You know, for instance, you know, with my kids that I coach, and this year I had a wonderful coaching experience at uh, a school in New Rochelle called the Ursuline School. I coach girls and we won a championship there. You know, I would talk to them about Michael Jordan and you, you watch Michael Jordan, you watch clips from him and you see him hitting game winner after game winner after game winner. And and when girls were upset and, and players are upset in general through my career about their shooting, I always point to that. I said, you know, how many how many game winning shots do you think he made? And that, oh, you know, 100. I said, yeah, well, you know how many he took? He probably took a thousand. So, you know, that's not a great batting average. But, again, all that's shown is the fact that he made those 100 shots. And, you know, and Mike would be the first one to tell you, you know, he had to go out and work on his game. When he first got into the league, if you watch his shot, he used to shoot a line drive. And, you know, Johnny Bach and and the guys in Chicago worked with him and put some arc on the ball, and he became a very good shooter. So, you know, unfortunately, kids don't see those things, 
And it's important um, to, to really understand the discipline that it takes to, to, to make it to the, to, to the show. And what a show it is. And you definitely played there, brother. You definitely played there. Um, let's go back to that time when, you know, you knew that you wanted to move on from North Carolina. Were there other schools in contention with St. John's or you knew that's where you wanted to go once they reached out to you? I pretty much reached out to them. I, my mother was, uh, I'm the youngest of my family and my mother was living in, in Flushing in Queens. And, um, I just thought to myself, uh, my, both my brothers went away, uh, and played, uh, my oldest brother played at the university of Miami in Florida. Chris was at North Carolina. And I just thought to myself, if I'm going to, if I'm going to sit on a bench, I'd rather do it near home. And my mom could come and see every game instead of you know, agonizing over which game to go to and, you know, how much it would cost to, to travel there. So I, I was, I was very lucky through a, a New York beat writer uh, was doing a story on me when I was down in Carolina at the time. And uh, I, he said, you don't sound too happy. You're, you seem to be playing well. And I said, oh, well, I'm not. And he said, well, is, can we do anything about that? And that time, you, you know, St. John's couldn't contact me. That was, you know, because against the rules. I said, well, I said, I really would love to go to St. John's. And uh, I was reminded that they were number one at the time. And I said that I, I, I'm not afraid of that. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's in my backyard. My family's there. I think I'll, I'll be just fine. And like I had said, uh, you know, coach Cornisaka, I called, pick up the phone and he said, get on the next plane. And, uh, before I knew it, I was registering and I, I couldn't go on full scholarship right away. Yeah, no transfer portal. I had to go, I had to register and I went to work and, and in my off time, I just worked in my game. What worked and went, went and, and worked on basketball. That was kind of my life at that time. But uh, it turned out uh, to be an incredibly wonderful experience. No instant gratification there, brother. You had to work your way to get back to where you need to be. And I think that's one of the things that made you the man that you are today. Thank you. Very kind of you. Yes. So transition now once you get to St. John's. Does it feel like home? Does it feel like a place that you know I'm a, I'm gonna finish here and do what I have to be to become the player that I want to be? Absolutely. Uh, when I first got to St. John's, um, when I was able to, when I went on scholarship after sitting out, um, I was working out with um, I was working out with the uh, the, the the big team and. Um, I, I still wasn't able to play and I made the mistake of uh, taking Christmas off. I, uh, I, I'd left uh, Christmas morning. We had practice at two o'clock in the afternoon and coach Granaseca, uh let's just say he, <laughs> he got my number at home and got me on the phone. And there were a few expletives that he said on the phone and basically get your ass back in here. Now uh, I felt at home. And, uh, and he, he was so kind. He took me aside and he said, you know, you're what makes this team go. You're one of those guys, your intensity, you're pushing guys like Mark, Walter, Shelton, Willie Glass, uh, I, you know, you're, you're beating them up. You're making them the, the team that they are. And I felt right at home, uh, that, and then when I finally made the club, taking that ride into New York and coming over 495 you see manhattan and the empire state building was the top of it was red and white and i was like wow this is really something uh, to have your home court is madison square garden and uh you know there was nothing better so yeah i i hell i want to stay there forever <laughs> and isn't it fitting the flyer that i you know i made up uh had the empire state building right behind you right so that was awesome. perfect perfect <laughs> that's right that's right so once you get there you know those guys obviously they leave right and then who was your teammates let's talk about some of your teammates that you played with you know the boo harvey the jason williams billy singleton shelton jones and michael porter what was that like well it, it, there was a lot of change the, the, the thing about st john's and what made luke karnaseka 
the the Hall of Fame coach that he that he is um, was that he he was able to get players along with Ron Rutledge and uh, Brian Mahoney. I mean, those three guys scoured um, the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut area, and and they took a lot of throwaways. I mean, uh, Ron Rowan was a guy that went to uh, Notre Dame, came back and played. Uh, at St. John's. Walter Berry was a, a junior college guy, came back and played at St. John's. Uh, my years, my first year I was with uh, Mark Jackson. Uh, our lineup was Mark, myself in the backcourt. Willie Glass was our small forward. Uh, Shelton and uh, it was a platoon between Terry Bross and Marco Baldy. And, uh, it, it, and we ended up going to the second round and losing to uh, Vernon Maxwell in Florida uh, out in Utah. Um, and, and that and those guys were great. That was Mark. Mark had uh, uh, Mark had a great year and uh, deservedly got drafted and 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 turned out to have a career that I don't think even he expected. Uh, the next year, uh, you mentioned Boo and and Mike Porter. Mike Porter, I don't know what that guy's legs were made of, but man, they were like springs. That guy had to be five seven. You know, I know they tried to stretch him out in the rack a little bit for the for the scorecard to make him, uh, you know, six foot. But he, he right. was about five eight. But man, he had a vertical leap of about six feet. And you know, the first time in practice, you know, he and Boo played together in ju in junior college is where uh, St. John's got him from. For one of the first times down, Boo's at half court and he just throws a lob, and I don't know who the hell he's throwing it to. And all of a sudden, just see this like look like Mighty Mouse. You know, Mike Porter catches it, and, and it's like he's about to bite the rim. He's that high and just flushes it. And I'm like, okay, we're alive. We, we, we've got some players. So, you know, that year was those two guys and Shelton Jones. And then we had, uh, of course, Jason Williams came in. And, and, uh, and Jason is just an incredible, incredible basketball player, an even better person. Um, he, uh, for us, he was a scorer um and just could find the rim um and then then my last year is when we had uh uh malik seely um Lord rest, Sorry, rest in peace yes yeah. yes yeah um and uh, rob Wardan. uh we, we started a point guard his name was jason buchanan a guy from syracuse myself mm -hmm. and, uh, and and jay williams and we win the nit and uh and jay williams gets uh the mvp and if it wasn't for him we wouldn't have won um, and, and, you know, all, all these guys, all, all these guys went on to have really good careers. I mean, Jason, you know, I really love Jason Williams because that guy was absolutely ferocious and which I can identify with. And, uh, yeah, he, that guy would not be denied. And he had, you know, quite a life story. Uh, you know, he had two sisters that passed away on him when he was at St. John's. He raised their kids when he was at St. John's managed to play. Got to the, got to the uh, NBA with the Nets, um, and uh, reinvented himself. He, he looked at Dennis Rodman and said, "You know what? I'm not going to be a scorer in this league, but I'm going to be a rebounder." And to his credit, he, uh, he he got himself strong and and made the All Star team. So you know, before he had his injury and and some other unfortunate things, but uh, Jason is a very very good friend of mine and. Uh, you know, all those guys are, you know, there, there isn't, there isn't a guy in the crowd that I could say uh, th that I'm not friends with. Man, Jason, Jason's just one of them ones, man. Uh, definitely uh, seeing his potential early on playing AU ball with him. Uh, great scorer, but also a ferocious rebounder. He, he just had <clears throat> that, that dog in him. Definitely. And Jason carries that into his personal life. He, he runs uh, and he backs it up with his own money. It's a nonprofit down in Florida. He has yep. a, a clinic called the Rebound Clinic, and uh, we're trying to, you know, get some donors and raise money for him as well. Um, but he's he's funded it himself. Uh, he, he's taken in a lot of people and paid paid their way, and uh, he's done an incredible job. And he's really just one of those people that just wants to help folks. And, uh, yeah, we're, we'll be friends for life. Definitely. When you see him and speak to him, tell him, as Glenn Harding said, 
What's up? And uh, keep fighting a good fight. Will do. All right. So who, who was the best player or best players you faced in college? Because I know you faced them all, and, and I know you had the whole a lot of them as well. Um, if you can remember off the top of the head some of the guys that you had to go against battle-wise. You, you'd be surprised at this. And you know what? It, his, you're going to have to help me. His na- I always forget his name, but he was the left-handed guard at Syracuse. Um, he hit the last. He, uh, oh, oh my! He, he was a shooter. He was from. He was from Syracuse. I don't know why. You know, I, it's probably by design that I forget his name because he was right. such a in the ass. But uh, 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 Greg Monroe. Yes, Greg, yes, 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 yes. Greg Monroe. Greg Monroe was, we were similar um, in the fact, except for him being left-handed, but he was big and strong. And, you know, when I, when I had moved to two guard, I, I, I could bounce guys all over the place. Um, but Greg, you know, he, he took a shot or two and uh, he just, that guy was just really, really tough to defend. He could shoot, he could drive, he could pass um, and was a very, very good defender. So, um, I, I really, he was one of the guys I didn't, I really didn't like to play. And, and, and I, and in my job at St. John's, I, you know, I, I was a defensive specialist. I, I took on, you know, all, all the toughest assignments. I mean, we played, uh, we had a home and home with UCLA and, and uh, I had to play Reggie Miller and uh, you know, Reggie Miller was a great, great shooter, but uh, compared to a lot of the guards at that time uh, in the big East, uh, he, he, he would have had a rough time. Wow. Said so Greg Monroe's from the Rochester area. That's right. That's right. Wow. Appreciate that, brother. Appreciate it. Man, you know, me being a, a guy who played defense as well, you know, those guys who can shoot it and had the green light to shoot it a thousand times a game, <laughs> some of the toughest guys to play against because, you know, sooner or later they're going to catch fire. And it's your job to kind of make sure that they don't or don't catch too much fire and burn the whole house down. Right. Uh, that that's for sure. And my job was to make sure that uh, they got cold pretty fast. So I, I I had a few tricks up my sleeve, and you know, like I said, you know, playing against uh, a guy early on as a 17 year old uh, against Michael Jordan that that really helped. I mean, Michael was just. Uh, an incredible, he, he's probably the, the closest thing to God's perfect athlete. He was, had all, all God's gifts and that guy had an intensity and a drive that was just unparalleled. And, uh, when I ended up going to, uh, Chicago, I mean, you just see guys drop in front of him. I mean, they, as soon as he got the ball, he was, he just look at you and guys would just bail out. Um, I was fortunate because I wasn't too smart and I, and I knew him since, he was 18, so uh, we had a, we had some uh, good battles when I was there. Yeah, wow. This is we we definitely want to get into that a little bit more. But do, besides, like, was it? Let's mention him, Michael Jordan, playing against him, and those other guys that you battled. Were it those battles that made you realize that you could play on the next level? What was it that gave you that spark to say, you know what? Maybe I can play on the next level. Well, after I had left North Carolina, um, you know, I thought I had kind of a, well, I did have a huge dose of reality. And, um, you know, my, my focus shifted a little bit in terms of getting my degree uh, and, and having a meaningful degree, um, which I did get at St. John's. But uh, as I started to play in the Big East, it definitely was – for those years, the toughest conference every night was a fight. I mean, you talk yeah. about Georgetown, you know, going against guys like Reggie, uh, Reggie Williams and, um, you know, Charles Smith and Alonzo. We, we played a Georgetown team that had Alonzo morning and Dikembe Mutombo as their front line. Woo. Uh, you know, and we had, you know, Marco Baldi and, you know, a great guy. But, uh, you know, uh, and Elton and, and Jason and, uh, you know, those guys, I think they had like 
13 block shots against us at the cap center, but you know, we, we played them hard and uh, we won a few games, but the, I figured it out really. Uh, once I got, you know, got to play, we, we put my, my, my first year, I had, was moved into the starting lineup after probably about seven, eight games. And um, we were playing in the, uh, the holiday festival. And at the time, the, the holiday festival what was the Christmas tournament to be in. And we were playing, uh, uh, it was St. John's, uh, Memphis State, Georgia Tech, and Virginia. And uh, we played Virginia uh, the first night. We beat them. And then uh, Georgia Tech beat Memphis State, and we beat Georgia Tech um, in, in the final, which was, you know, the place was packed, 20,000 people. And uh, I ended up, I was fortunate to be picked for the uh, all tournament team. So I think it was at that point that I figured, you know, I, I had a shot at, at, at making it on the next level. Wow. Those tournaments, man, those Christmas tournaments, those, you know, just the big East alone um, was definitely something that we all watched in the metropolitan area um, and look forward to watching all the time because that was the ticket. You got a ticket to, to go there it was like being in basketball heaven. But if you were just in front of the television, you can watch it, what was going on. Uh, we would go, we would watch the, the Big East games, and then the next day we'd be out in the park playing, trying to mimic you guys. So it, it, it was definitely uh, fun to watch. Definitely as fun to watch. Buddy, that's good. <laughs> Say it again, what you said? As long as you didn't hurt anybody, that's good. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> not at all, not at all, not at all. So, you know, after college, you you went um, undrafted, with, but was picked up by the Chicago Bulls, right? Yeah. Um, I had uh, uh, Coach Karnasaka called me in his office. He had gotten a call from Jerry Krause, who was the longtime GM and kind of the guy who, who was the architect of the great Bulls franchise. And um, I thought it was for a front office job. So, I put on a suit. They were playing the Knicks in the playoffs. They wanted to meet me in at the Hyatt Regency. I put on a suit. I had an empty briefcase to just to act the part because I, I thought it was a front <laughs> office job. Oh, in oh, and oh, Jackson's oh, there and oh, Johnny. <laughs> taking a play, taking a play. Yo, hold on, man. Yo, <laughs> Yo hold on. Yo, you had an empty briefcase? Yes, Yo. I did. That is the best, man. That is the best, man. Go ahead, continue the story. My bad. That was crazy. We're New Yorkers, man. We had to do what we had to do to get ahead. That's right. Fake it till you make it, baby. That, that, <laughs> fake it till you make it. Right. So I walk into this meeting and there's and Phil Jackson, you know, and what's with the briefcase? And I'm like, oh crap, I've got to open it up. And I said, God, this is really kind of a prop. And they go, oh, okay. I said, well, I hope I still have a job. And they said, you don't understand. We want you to come in and try out. And I said, really? And uh, they said, we've been getting beaten up by the Pistons for the past couple of years, and we can't seem to get over the top. And we need someone to come in, you know, pretty much for the preseason and really beat up Michael. And, uh, you know, and Jerry, of course, he goes, I've seen you play. You know, you, you run through walls, you do whatever Coach Karnasaka told you. Can you do the same thing for us? And I said, well, sure, sure. I, I had no problem. I mean, you know, this was all borrowed time in my mind. And uh, off we went. And uh, I had gone out there literally that, you know, after the, the season was over, they had lost. Uh, they had lost to the Pistons again. And um, a couple of weeks later, and was there was a, a, a rookie camp and 300 guys show up. Mm for three days. And, um, and I just shook my head. I go, what the heck is going on here? And, uh, they kept two of us. And so made, made it through that. Um, then played in the summer league. Um, and at the time that BJ Armstrong, they, they had drafted BJ Armstrong, Stacy King and Jeff Sanders. So they had three rookies. So uh, to keep a fourth was, was almost an impossibility, but, uh, I really played my way. Um, and, and there's still a story on on the internet uh, that uh, Charlie Rosen wrote from the Chicago Tribune, and th there's a few Pinocchios to it. But uh, 
you know, is how Michael and I went at it and he ended my career, but uh, it, it kind of not, didn't work out that way, but, but, you know, we, we went at it and uh, I stayed around and uh, made it through all the preseason. And, and then uh, Phil said, look, we can't keep four rookies. We want you to play for uh, the Rockford lightning, our CBA affiliate. And at that point I had played so well um, that I thought to myself, you know, I, these guys are going to are probably going to be the best team ever assembled. And I held my own. I virtually made the team by them wanting to keep me. And I said, I'm just going back to New York. I, I, there's jobs waiting for me and there's got to be life after this. And, and it started to hurt a little bit, you know, physically, you know, pounding on those guys three times a day. And, uh, but, you know, I, again, I don't know anybody who faces Michael Jordan day in and day out could find anything better. It, it just, just, it just isn't not then, not before then, and not today. Um, you know, Michael is just the most incredible basketball player. And I don't think anyone can touch him. Yeah. Let's, let's, can we, can we touch on that uh, incident for a moment that everybody's talking about? Because there's a few articles that I've seen um, that they talk about that, that incident um, that exchange between you and Michael was like, you know, you gave him a hard foul. And then a couple of games later, a couple of practices later, um, he got revenge on you and kind of ended your <laughs> career. We there, yeah. only thing we get is those articles. And, and you know, now I have, but can you straighten that out for me, please? Or, or sure. the whole audience. Thank you. Sure. We, um, we were, we were probably a, a week into a veteran camp and uh, we were doing three a day practices. So uh, we were going from eight till 1030, coming back at 12, going 12 till 230. And then we were coming back at five and going five to eight. Uh, and the first two sessions were, first one was basically running drills. The second one was running the plays, offenses and defenses. And the third one were the scrimmages. So um, I hadn't been paired up with Michael uh, up until this this event. Um, and, and Jerry and Phil took me aside and said, listen, you know, you know, you want to make this club and you, know, you want to make us good, uh, you know, go after him. And and I did uh, first time down the court. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I love Bill Cartwright. His elbows were like the size of a, a tractor trailer. He had the wingspan. It was unbelievable. Uh, but Michael gave um, gave Scotty a, a backdoor signal, which I missed. And I was overplaying him on the sideline. And Bill kind of clipped me from behind, set a backpack, and they threw Michael a lob. And he dunked the ball. And there was oohs and ahs and all that stuff. And I was I was just so angry with myself because I didn't read the play. So Michael, being the competitor he is, came by and he knows my brother and he knew me and, and he tapped me on the shoulder. He said, don't worry about that, Brusty. You're just one of the many I've done that to. Woo. So I, so I looked at him and I said, okay. I said, why don't you run it again? So he, uh, so Michael always up for a challenge, always, always being a sportsman and, and just, just a great guy. Once, twice down and I'm looking the other way, but you know, I do have peripheral vision, so I, I did catch the signal. So he uh, he goes to slide back door. I sidestep Bill's um, pick, and as he goes to jump, I forearmed him in his Adam's apple. So down goes Michael, <laughs> flat on his back, and the whole place is like it's <laughs> I, I have to call a tech on the player. Another tech. These are all positive tech. You forearm Mike in that apple? Yes. Yeah, I, I figured that was a vulnerable spot. Um, he goes down and it was there was a hush that went over the facility like we were in church. They said, oh, my God, Russ just killed the star. <laughs> so Michael got up uh, in typical fashion. And after that, it was it was on. And it's extremely rare that that Michael loses his cool. But, uh, you know, Horace Grant started getting in my ear and Scotty was getting in my ear, John Paxson. And they're like, keep doing it, keep doing it. You know, piss him off. And we ended up 
um, going through the whole scrimmage. And believe it or not, I actually blocked one of his shots and Michael only had six points. And um, I, I don't even, I, I did score. I don't remember what I had, but my job was defending him. And uh, we came out in the fourth quarter and it, and it was late and he was so upset. Um, he, they set up for an out of bounds play and he just elbowed me square in the head before the ball was bounded. And I kind of went down on one knee and I ended up looking at Phil and said a few words to Phil, like, what the hell is going on here? And Phil goes, that's it. All done. So that was what happened. Um, I have read a few of the accounts. My, my two young daughters who are not uh, young anymore. I told them the story years ago because they read it and they're like, dad, this, that, that man hurt you. I said, that's the, that's the Pinocchio story. So, Got you. Got you. so yeah, but uh, no, but Michael, uh, you know, he just incredible competitor. And I, I was just, you know, again, after that, I was, where else can you go? I mean, there was like Michael Ruzioni scoring the goal for, for the 1980 Olympic team to beat the Russians. I mean, wh where do you go from there? I mean, it's just, uh, you know, to be able to hold your own against the best player that ever was uh, and, and probably ever will be. I know that's a bold statement, but, you know, but the teams that Michael had to play against, and the defenses that were thrown at him, the physical punishment he took, and, and he did what he did. Um, man, that was just, uh, thank God for such a wonderful experience. Well, now we know not only did the Detroit Pistons get Mike Tuffer, but also Matt Bruss. So, <laughs> that's right. That's right. No doubt, no doubt. What, 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 what made you get into coaching? You know, I, I, I've been in the business world for probably 30 years at this point. And through the years, uh, I've been asked to uh, be on different shows and give some lectures and things like that. And um, I, I always kind of wanted to get into to coaching. Um, and I did it sporadically. Um, in the past few years, I've uh, I've really found it to be really rewarding. Um, and just to be able to give back to the kids uh you know some some wisdom uh try to correct what's going on today and show them that it's it's not instant gratification that 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 anybody if you work hard enough and and have heart uh you know who knows where that'll take you and uh and coaching these young kids uh, on on the high school level and and even young kids at college mentoring them um, it's been very, very satisfying. Uh, I'd said earlier, I, my first year I've ever coached girls and, um, I had a group of JV girls that I just threw my resume out there and they, that was, they were gracious enough to hire me at the Ursuline school in New Rochelle. And, uh, my kids went 18 and two, and, uh, it was one of the best experiences I've had uh, around the game of basketball. Um, it, it was so pure. They, they bought into uh, what I was teaching them. And we didn't have one outstanding star that dominated. Everybody contributed and uh, just the feedback from the girls. And it's like I had 15 daughters all over again and, and the parents were all wonderful. Uh, it was just a, 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 an incredible experience. So I'm going to keep on doing it. Good for you, man. Good for you. Uh, I had uh, the pleasure of coaching girls <clears throat> during one game. It was actually at half. Um, it was <clears throat> a memorial event for a friend of mine, uh, Mo Kerbu, who passed away uh, during COVID. And the coach had to leave for a family emergency. And one of my guys who was running the event asked me to step in um, to coach the girls. And, man, I still talk about it to this day. You know, I've coached boys for 15, 20 years off and on. And that one half of coaching girls is like one of the best experiences as a coach because mm. they, they kind of listen to everything you say. If you tell them to do something, they're going to do All it right. and, and maximize it. And the fact that, you know, they don't have the athleticism of the guys, uh, a lot of it is using their brains and fundamentals. So that was a, a pleasure for me. So I understand and definitely relate to your experience as a uh, 
a girls basketball coach and actually uh congratulate you on winning the championship as well thank you so much it was it was such a delight to coach them and and even coaching the boys uh won a championship with the with the boys team in Greenwich at uh, Greenwich High School. That's right. In 2020, right? You did that in 2020. Yeah. And a lower level on the on the freshman team and they hadn't won anything in years and again it's just getting the kids to believe in what you're doing. Um and you're either, you know, there's no such thing in my view as uh you know raw talent. Uh I, I think there's trained and untrained. And uh if, if the kids believe in you and, you know, I've certainly been there I know, you know, when you know what you're talking about and they buy into it, uh, they can do some incredible things. Do you want to coach at the college level one day or, or is high school good enough for you? Oh, I'd love to coach on the college level. I, I, I think, uh, in, in fact, I would really invite it because I think the stuff that they're doing today uh, is, is too much like the NBA. Um, it, it's all about offense and ultimately the teams like look at this year's final four, the teams that are winning are the teams that are playing defense. Yeah. I mean, FAU, S San Diego state. I mean, you don't see, and, and people talk about parody and all that sort of stuff. And, and then there's some truth to that, but these teams that aren't high profile schools get these kids that have a chip on their shoulder and are willing to work. And the best place to start is on the defensive end. That's why you see upsets. It has nothing to do with, you know, this team outscored that team. It's, you know, if you're offensive minded, you may cruise through your regular season and, and have some soft teams. Um, but when you start to play against good teams, you better play defense. And uh, if you don't, you'll sink. And that's why I think a lot of these teams, you know, uh, and everyone is every year. It's like March Madness, March Madness, and it's there's nothing mad, there's nothing insane about it. It's it's these teams, <laughs> they have nothing to lose, and they they play defense. They are not intimidated, and uh, as the years go on, it's just it it gets better and better. But it's I, I would love to coach on the college level, and heck, I I'd, I'd be running the stuff that's been working for a hundred years. You know, we could still get three point shots, but if you if you formulate your offense around high screen rolls and uh, you know kickouts and and you know not utilize your your big man, well, guess what? The defense push presses you out further and further and further. And I hate to break it to people, but not everybody can shoot like Steph Curry and Clay Thompson. Uh, you know, they just can't. You know, those are those are two or three guys, and maybe a half dozen or a dozen guys that can do that in the planet. So a lot of these these schools are, are running these offenses and they're not utilizing the inside out game. So with both, all the teams that I have an inside out game, we get plenty of three point shots, but we also, you know, back the defense off. So where we get open shots. When you look at Florida Atlantic, San Diego, uh, San Diego state, right? Right. Miami, Florida, the only team that has been there before is UConn. Right. None of these other schools have ever been to the Final Four at this level. You know, Miami's been known as a football school forever. Right. Um, but for now, for them to be there is just simply amazing and just shows you what you said, how far defense can take you. Well, That's you know, uh, UConn uh, got there. Uh, they, they believe in – I mean, they play pressure defense. Yes, and yeah. And when you're on the big stage like that, you know, guys start throwing the ball around the gym. And uh, it, it's not easy, uh, especially take it from a guy. My job is inbounding the ball. You know, that that's that's not an easy job. It sounds simple. But when there's a press on and some athletes really extending themselves, uh, it can cause all kinds of problems. And each one of those teams, you know, it's their defense that got them there for sure. Man, man. When it's all said and done, what do you want people to remember about Matt Bruss? Well, I, I, I'm just grateful that I had the opportunity. Uh, God's been so good to me to, to give me the chance to play uh, at the University of North Carolina, learn from that experience, and then grow from that. And, and of course, uh, playing for uh, Coach Karnaseka, who's my father, honestly he's he's just a, he's been in my life and still is today um 
I would just, uh, I, I guess people, I'd like them to remember what they, they remember me for it uh, now. It's that I was, a, I, I didn't have a ton of talent, but um, I had a lot of heart. And uh, one thing I would do is if you were going to play me that night, that you were in for a fight and, you know, and that that's just playing in t- with intensity and drive and protecting your home turf. And, and it was like a war. And for people to remember me as, as a guy that went to war every night, that would be good enough for me. If you could change one thing about your basketball journey, what would it be? I want to probably stay with Rockford for a little while. And then as soon as a couple of guys got hurt, maybe played a little bit with Chicago, but um, you know, young man's dreams and you know, you get older and you know, things become very clear. And uh, you know, I, I have to say the one, one thing I, I was taught again by Lou Kronoseka, who was just a father figure to me and a philosopher and a psychiatrist. Um he just said, you don't want to have any regrets, son. And uh, he just pumped it into my head. He said, you can, he goes, no matter whether you win or lose or what the score is, if you can walk off the court and say you left everything you had on that court, he said, then you become a man and you will have no regrets and you can live with that, whether we win with or without the championships. That's dope, man. That's both. Listen, we want to get into the last part of the show, probably our most toughest segment besides the questions and top five, top five, top five, top five. All right. Matt, we'll put you on the hot seat right now. Um, Some of your picks may have guys calling in. Why was an hour on your top? It's only top five. Can't do a sub. Six men or seven from this five. Cool. Sounds good. You're right about people calling in. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely gonna happen. All right. So top five against. Well, let's see. Um I probably would have um I definitely would have Jason Williams as my power forward. Um of course and I would this, have- this is played against. Oh, playing Not again. Playing with. Yes. Oh, okay. To, to play against. Yes, oh. that's that. That was that. That was the first. Yep. Top five players you played against. Oh, okay. Um. Wow. Uh. I played against so many guys. Um. I'd have to say, uh, of course, Michael Jordan. Uh, is the top of the list. Um. Greg Monroe from Syracuse was always a a, a tough assignment. Pick. Five guys from Georgetown, <laughs> you know, those guys would run the shoes off you. Um, in particular, Reggie Williams was was extremely difficult to defend. Uh, uh, I, I, I didn't get a chance to play against Patrick. Um, glad I didn't. Um, you got two more. You got two more. Um, gosh, I, I'd have to say uh, in my time, uh, Probably Kenny Smith uh, and uh, probably David Robinson. Got gotcha. you. Gotcha. And I know I left a lot of guys out, so I am sorry to all those guys. You know, <laughs> but uh, even if I would have given thought to it, I still would have left guys out. <laughs> right, right, right. But you also mentioned the purr earlier, so definitely that's. Oh you, God, you, yeah. Can I forget? You played it? against. You played against a ton, a ton of people, right? So now the top five players you played with, now you can bring in uh, my guy, Jason Williams. Well, I, of course, I'd have Jason. Jason would be my power forward, and and I'd, I'd put him up against anybody. Um, I, I'd love to have Mark Jackson as as a point guard. Um, my gosh. Uh, can it be the same guys that I played against? <laughs> hey. You could bring. Remember, you played with Derek Brown as well, who carried you guys in the Empire State games. I would bring in Shelton Jones. I'd bring in Derek Brower. Um, gosh, uh, Pearl Washington would definitely be my point guard. Got you, got you, got you. 
No doubt. Well, he, he, you, he couldn't be a point guard because you played against him. You would have to be Mark Jackson or Boo Harvey. Right. I, I, I Both those guys would have me sitting on the uh, – have me sitting on the bench, so you know I'll take both. <laughs> got you, got you, got you. All right, you're going back to your hometown now. Not your hometown, but your home area, Long Island. Mm -hmm. I need you to name the top five players in Long Island history. Wow, um, you know I'll be dating myself with this. Um, That's okay. I'd have to say uh, Glenn Vickers from Babylon, uh, Stan Wilcox from North Babylon, Jeff Rulin from Sachem, mm. uh, Mitch Kupchak, Woo. and the one and only Julius Irving from Roosevelt High School. <laughs> Not too bad. That wasn't too hard. Not not too bad at all. Not too bad at all, man. You, you did very well, man. You did very well. Well, listen, Matt, um, I'm glad you was able to come on, man. I had a lot of fun with you. Um, like I said, when I was a kid, um, you was one of the guys who I looked up to on the defensive end and, and gave me that 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 inner toughness to know that, you know, if you challenge someone, um, they will respect you at the end of the day. So I want to say thank you. And just to say, brother, uh, Appreciate you, and thank you for all that you gave for New York. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're one of our greats, man. Appreciate you, brother. Thank you for having me on the show, and good luck with the show. It's a terrific. I've watched uh, a couple podcasts. It's great. You guys really uh, get down to it and have some great guests on, and uh, I'll be watching. Appreciate you, brother. Take it easy, and I'll, I'll be speaking to you soon. Okay, bye now. All right. Wow. Listen, when we talk about some of New York's great basketball players, you know you got to venture out to Long Island. These guys had some of the best basketball players in New York history. All right? And Matt was just one of them. Matt came out, recruited by North Carolina down to ACC, and figured out he had to make his own way. So he came back home to St. John's, made a name for himself. After college was over, you know, he'd go out to Chicago and also make a, a, a another name for himself being one of the toughest guys that ever played against Michael Jordan and help make that team one of the toughest teams in the NBA to compete for an NBA championship. Now, I know y'all going to say it was Detroit but it had to be those guys in practice and those guys who was, you know, bumping Mike around and challenged him to take him to the next level. And I'm glad to say my guy Matt was one of them. No matter how your story ends, there's always a beginning. And everything in between sometimes can be a blur. But for guys like myself and all my basketball heads out there, we remember our greats. Matt Bruss, one of New York greats, Long Island legend. Salute. Listen, we're about to be out of here. I am your host, Glenn Poole Harding, and you've been watching Basketball Heads Live podcast on NYC Basketball Network because we are official for New York City basketball. Hey.